As the country celebrates Mandela Day, we're reminded of the difficult road that led to today's democratic dispensation. While some believe that the necessary compromises had to be made to achieve democracy, others lament what they call the selling out of the majority of citizens who still languish in poverty and despair. Good evening and welcome to Unfiltered. My name is Cizwe Mbofu Walsh. Can today's high inequality be blamed on the compromises reached during the Codessa moment? And what were these compromises? Joining us for this discussion are Paolo Jordan, former ANC Codessa negotiator, former PAC Codessa delegate, Jackie Siroke, and Robin Carlyle, a former Democratic Party Codessa delegate. Before we jump into our discussion, Let's watch this insert for context produced by Andrew Mukhatle. The road to a democratic South Africa was not all smooth sailing. Following several decades of apartheid rule and the armed struggle waged by various liberation movements, including the African National Congress, Pan Africanist Congress, and the Azanian People's Organization. The early 1990s became a historical period for the country. The release from prison of the late Mr. Nelson Mandela on 11 February 1990 became a milestone event that was to dominate headlines across the world. After spending 18 years of his 27-year prison sentence on Robben Island, he became one of key role players in the negotiations which were aimed at paving the way for a peaceful political transition. Given the volatile political climate at the time, the National Party government and the African National Congress were engaged on behind-the-scenes deliberations to find common ground on several sticking points. We have said that uh, the ANC will be prepared to consider the suspension of hostilities only if the government first removes the obstacles to negotiation. In both parties, stripping themselves of that in previous viewpoints from that which makes the attainment of the goal of peaceful solutions on a just and equitable manner impossible. These marathon engagements culminated in the Convention for a Democratic South Africa, CODESA I, whose first plenary session began at the World Trade Center in Kempton Park on 20 December 1991. Absent from the proceedings was the Pan-Africanist Congress, which had withdrawn from the negotiations a few days earlier. During CODESA II, negotiations broke down due to arguments over power sharing and majority rule. The impasse was followed by the Buipato massacre, which left about 46 people dead and several others severely injured. Following the killings, the ANC withdrew from the talks, with the organization blaming the National Party government for the incident. The negotiations hit another snag in June 1993 when thousands of the Afrikaner Verstandsbewering AVB stormed the World Trade Center. The AVB was opposed to the negotiations that sought to end apartheid rule. Never and never again shall it be that this beautiful land will again experience the oppression of one by another. The Codessa negotiations culminated in the ushering of a democratic dispensation and the inauguration of the first black president Nelson Mandela on 10 May 1994, following the landmark national elections on 27 April 1994. 32 years after the Codessa negotiations, some are asking whether the compromises at the table went too far given the country's myriad of challenges. According to Stats SA's report of 2022, 
South Africa continues to be the most unequal nation in the world. For the families of the victims, of the people who were lost during the struggle against apartheid. We can't run away from the fact that uh, as black South Africans, there's still a lot that needs to be done. Others decry the apparent lack of progress towards meaningful economic transformation and land ownership amongst others. Debates are raging on whether the constitution should be amended in order to expropriate land without compensation. The Land Audit Report of 2017 reveals that 72% of private land is owned by white people, while only 4% is in the hands of Africans. The exploitation of South Africa comes through the land, and the people of South Africa cannot benefit the mineral, through the mineral resources of South Africa. Our freedom is 30 years old, and we still don't have land freedom and economic freedom. Andrew Mokhatle, unfiltered, SABC News. Welcome back to Unfiltered, and let's dive into our conversation. Mr. Jordan, could we start with you? Of course, the transition to South Africa's democracy was a long and windy road, but tonight we're particularly focusing on the CODESA period, the 91-92 era of multi-party negotiations. In hindsight, with the benefit of three decades of lived experience, how do you see the wisdom of the CODESA moment in particular? Well, I think what we should accept firstly is that CODESA was a process of negotiation. And negotiation necessarily means that there are at least two opposing sides. In our instance, what we had at Codessa was the participation of probably every political trend and tendency in South Africa, excluding maybe the far right and maybe some of those groups that saw themselves as the far left. Negotiation requires compromise. So you're not going to get everything you want when you go into negotiations. So when one looks at the outcomes of CODESA, you have to bear those two things in mind. Now, a smart New York lawyer once said to me that when you go into negotiations, you demand the moon, knowing full well that in the end you might have to settle for Brooklyn. But he also said, if you start out demanding Brooklyn, you'll end up with Bedford Stuyvesant. So uh, you see, negotiations entail two parties who are perhaps like this. And then through the negotiation, you get to the point where you get to here. Neither side gets what it wanted necessarily. But I think in the negotiation process, the liberation movement got most of what it wanted, which was a unitary state, uh, a unitary state based on the diversity of our population, acceptance of its diversity, and hence we have our national slogan, unity in diversity. The non-liberation movement parties in the negotiations came in with a number of uh, suggestions whose uh, purpose was to thwart or undermine the impact of the African majority on the political process in democracy. They admitted, if you look at, for instance, uh, Van Selslabert's book, that they wrote together with David Walsh, he says one of their objectives is to evade majoritarianism. The National Party also came with that sort of program, as did the IFP. It was the ANC, the NICTIC delegation, 
one or two of the other homelands like Trad Sky and I think uh, Kwakwa, no, no, not Kwakwa, Wane, and the PAC who came in with a program for a unitary state. So we got most of what we wanted, but we didn't get everything we wanted. Can I take you up on that? Because I think your position is particularly interesting because you were quite a critical voice within the liberation movement of negotiations, although you participated. And I was reading a piece that you wrote in The African Communist in 1992, just after Codessa, where you said that negotiations had become an objective in themselves rather than part of an overall strategy. And so internally in the movement, you were saying that negotiations had in some ways become fetishized. Do you still think that there was too much emphasis on negotiation or does the benefit of hindsight mean that you've revised that position from, from 92? <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, the internal movement debate was about uh, the manner in which we negotiate and the debate was uh, accepting the premise that you're not going to get everything that you want. How much were you willing to give up? That was the debate in the movement. And uh, my argument, uh, I think the principal... Uh, Antagonists in that were Joe Slover and myself. Yes. And I thought that what Comrade Joe was proposing was going a bridge too far. I didn't win that particular argument, but, you know, I think it uh, says something about both the movement and about the negotiation process that that debate took place. Absolutely. And we'll come back to some of the points that you've made uh, Mr. Siroke, you were a delegate, PAC delegate, at least to the extent that the PAC did participate before withdrawal. How do you look back on that moment? And again, with the benefit of hindsight and given what Mr. Jordan has said, do you think that CODESA 1 and 2 can be looked at as a wise step towards democracy or a moment when the compromises which have come back to haunt us first became manifest? Look, I, I, I think that um, negotiations by themselves are a site of struggle. Um, and the process that takes place um, in that site of struggle uh, would, would indicate who's winning uh, the debate, who's winning the war, uh, and which side uh, has the upper hand. In our experience with CODESA as the Pan-Africanist Congress of Azania, we... Um, to use a, a, an image that, that would make sense. We were looking at, um, we were aiming at the moon uh, and hoping that we would, we, we would get the moon. And if we fail to get the moon, we'll get the stars. Um, but it never really worked uh, the way we, we, we had imagined. We looked at South Africa as a, uh, a complex uh, colonial, settler colonial state that needed to be addressed, especially the root cause of the problems in South Africa. And our understanding politically was that the 1909 Act of Union, which was made in the British Westminster um, Parliament, uh, that established South Africa, was based on, on colossal fraud. It was a fraud of the land uh, that established uh, the, the South Africa as we know it today. And we felt that if we raise the issue of the land, and eradicate um, ownership of the land by colonial settlers. We start on a first, first date. That was our moon. That's, that's the light we're aiming to achieve. But do, you, the, do you regret withdrawing from the talks? Do you think that you could have made that case strongly within the CODESA framework? Or do you actually think that withdrawing from the talks in hindsight was the appropriate step? No, the, the, um, there are two instances in which um, the withdrawal from the talks took place. In the first instance, the, the international organizations, including the, the, the United Nations Committee Against Apartheid, uh, the OAU, the, uh, and other uh, progressive international forum, had insisted that the PAC 
and the ANC should together go and negotiate. Um, and the PAC's approach to the negotiations was obviously not the same as that of the ANC. And we had those, those difficulties. We went to the first CODESA, as it showed in the, in the, in the first uh, in the insert. And at that, um, at that forum, we realized that uh, we, we had almost 14 Arab parties um, opposed to the PAC. And we felt this, is, this, this can never be a forum for negotiations. And that's why we, we drew. The next withdrawal was, was really based on the, uh, the difficulties we had with the apartheid regime. Whilst they were negotiating, negotiating uh, there was a lot of mass killings. Um, a low intensity war was taking place. So the regime was talking and killing our people. And we felt we could not, never really negotiate uh, in good faith under those conditions. Absolutely, and we will get into many of those questions as we unpack the conversation. But Mr. Carlisle, can I bring you in on the broad theme of our conversation and ask you to reflect on whether you think CODESA was a wise moment of political transition or ultimately unwise 30 years on. What's, what's your take having been a delegate? Well, you know, I, I have a very different view from my two colleagues and I greet them both. Um, I think that the, uh, what Kudesa achieved, which was in the end a new constitution for South Africa, was an absolutely remarkable historical achievement because never before had an oppressor given away his privileges before he lost power. And never before had the oppressed on gaining power sought reconciliation and not revenge. That's, that's amazing. Nobody else has ever achieved that. And that was due in the main to one very remarkable human being. It was not Mr. Declare, bless his soul, it was Nelson Mandela. It was Nelson Mandela who made it possible. Nelson Mandela with his integrity, with his courage, and with his determination. And you know, the electorate, straight after the, once, once the Kodesa had finished their work, and we went to elections in 1994, the electorate gave their approval in the greatest election that this continent has ever seen. And we've never had one like that again. So I want to say that to try to blame the rotten state of South Africa today on Kodesa is simply to avoid the realities that we all know are there. Kodesa gave a process for people to get involved. Not everybody got what they wanted. My party got very little of what it wanted. But in the end, my party and many others said, OK, we've got some sort of a deal. Let's go ahead with it. It is what happened after, and particularly after Mr. Mandela sadly stood down. That's when the trouble came in South Africa. That's when things broke down. That's when the hospital stopped working. That's when the roads fell apart. That's when the electricity didn't come when it should come. And I can go on and on and on. To blame that on Kodesa is, <laughs> it is such a, a, a cop-out. We know what went wrong. We know it's still going wrong. Let's not go and search for fairy tales where they don't apply. Right, and we're going to continue this conversation, which I suspect will soon become a debate. We have integral individuals involved in South Africa's passage into democracy. They were all involved in the CODESA moment. And we're talking CODESA, what it means for South African history, its past and also its present. Stick with us. The conversation is about to get deeper. Welcome back to Unfiltered. We're talking CODESA, the passage to democracy in South Africa, what it means not only for our history, but also for our present. Mr. Seroke, before we went to the break, Mr. Carlisle and Mr. Jordan had all, and, and you had given your overall assessments of 
the extent to which Codessa is at the root of our evils or our triumphs in South Africa. What do you think of the view propounded by Mr. Carlyle that in actual fact, the foundation of negotiations was perfect or was as good as you can get, and it's actually the way that the ANC has governed that has compromised South Africa's trajectory rather than the compact reached through the negotiations? Um, I think that um, the, Mr. Kalal is making a point, um, a misleading point, in fact, because the, the, the fact that our people in their various political formations were able to compromise and bring about a stable country uh, from those tough negotiations is a credit that should go to all. And all, all, all the, uh, the elements that were there, including the, the right wing, on the eve of the elections in 1994, the IFP was not even on the, on the ballot box. They had to paste it in uh, to be on, on the ballot box. Things were so tense in the country. It is, it is the, the ability of the people to come to some solution that I think is remarkable. And that cannot be um, uh, uh, wished away. It's something that the people as a whole um, have achieved. But it doesn't mean at the same time that uh, the, 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 the next phase, the, the constitutional democracy and taking it forward did not have its faults. It, it had its deep rooted faults from the nature of uh, the history of South Africa, the nature of deprivation of people from their land, the nature of poverty that was still there, the, um, the, the, the many other people who were there and the ability to, it's only the ability to compromise and, and face each other as, as compatriots that became the miracle that shocked the world. I mean, people could not expect us to continue to fight um, under those, those, those circumstances after we shook hands. Um, and, and most of the organizations that, were, that got the hot end of the stick managed to, to carry through, including the PAC. Uh, we were not going to uh, become bandits. And, and, and oppose something that the majority of the people are, 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 would be able to use. A democratic state, a constitutional democracy, is something that allows us to address the issues, but it is not the end of the struggle. Mr. Jordan, how do you respond to the view that the problem was not with our constitutional foundations or our negotiations, but actually what has undone much of the hope that that period suggested is in fact the way that the ANC has governed since the constitutional agreements? Well, there's something I find odd in uh, people like uh, Robin Carlyle. Uh, Robert Carlyle wants to elevate uh, Nelson Mandela into some sort of demigod which he might well deserve. But to try to suggest that it all owes itself to Nelson Mandela is to exaggerate his role. Mandela himself always used to underscore that he was acting as an agent of an organization of a body of people that he was leading. It was not his personal thing. It was the program of the ANC which resulted in no revenge, not Nelson Mandela. Uh, in terms of uh, what Robin Carlyle said, I thought we were going to discuss Codessa and not make this a party political broadcast. I could do that too if I wanted to, but I refrained from doing that. It was not going to be easy to undo 300 years of colonial domination. It was not going to be easy to undo 300 years of uh, legislated impoverishment and degradation of the majority of the people of this country. It was not going to be easy to undo the consequences of that. And the ANC has been trying. I'm not saying that we have done the best we possibly could. I'm sure that uh, you're familiar with some of the things I've said in criticism about the ANC's performance in government. But I think overall, we have tried put into place uh, the program of the democratic movement, the one that the democratic movement has subscribed to since 1912. Now, in terms of that, 
we have to look at our constitution as well. Everyone points fingers at the constitution, saying it needs to, we need to do this, that, the other with it. The constitution we have is a transformative constitution. And if people use it properly, I think it can actually achieve the objectives that we have set ourselves. What I think has been lacking is a lack of imagination on the part of those who say that it is the constitution, for example. That means we can't solve the land issue. The constitution makes ample provision for us to solve the land issue. Even with respect to that, if people say, for example, it needs to be amended in order to implement those sorts of changes. Again, it is the outcome of CODESA, not, to, not owing to the genius of Nelson Mandela, but owing, I think, to the genius of the movement he led, not Nelson Mandela alone. Mr. Carlyle, how do you respond to that, that personifying the transition around Nelson Mandela actually obscures the ANC's role, but also the idea that let's concede for the moment, even if Mr. Jordan won't, that governance has not gone very well. And, and it's an assumption I make, which sure can be contested. But our society's sheer stubborn inequality does seem to have something to do with, with the fundamental assumptions of the negotiations, does it not? Well, first of all, let me say that I find little to disagree with in terms of what uh, Dr. Jordan says. Um, and I'm not suggesting that, uh, that Mr. Mandela was the only uh, um, driving force in this process. Um, the Nats were in very serious trouble. He knows that as well as I do. And they, which pushed them towards the table. But in the end, it was one man's will, never mind the ANC collective, it was one man's will that made this possible and saw it through to him. But I, I don't want to get involved in that particular quarrel on this particular day. Um, but as, 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 as Dr. Jordan says, everything was there in that constitution and 30 years to use those instruments. And, and you know, I was a, a, a provincial uh, um, a, a minister of, of uh, a public, uh, um, whatever, but the buildings, etc., etc. And I watched the, 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 the endless failure of the national government to redistribute land in any kind of a, a sufficient way, in any kind of workable way, in any kind of way that would have lasted. They just haven't done it. For 30 years, they haven't done anything except make a mess. And I'm afraid the only collective that they have achieved with, I think, huge success was the looting of South Africa and its people. Mr. Siroke, our conversation has moved through the helpful interventions of, of both our other panelists onto the question of the constitution and especially the question of land. Former Deputy Chief Justice Dihang Moseneke, also a former Deputy President of the PAC, makes an interesting admission in, in his memoir, the first one, My Own Liberator, where he says, Section 25 of the Constitution was the biggest compromise we made. There's no way around accepting that we made a compromise there on land. Do you agree with that assessment? And do you think the compromise that he adverts to is at the heart of some of the inequality that we see today? Or do you think that the Constitution actually does make ample provision for redistribution, particularly on the land question? No, the, the, the property clause, uh, the section you are referring to, um, locks uh, the, the, the land into a, a process that can mostly, to a great extent, be resolved through the courts. Um, uh, and, and those processes are not um, a surefire way to resolve the issue of the land. The, um, the, 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 the government of the day 
including the, the past 30 years when the ANC has been in power, they haven't been able to, to, to utilize the constitution as the political party in power to redistribute the land. Uh, they have been afraid to do that to, um, where necessary, uh, uh, appropriate um, land uh, and use it for, for public good, for, for, for the government's own uh, programs. They've been afraid to, to focus on the issue of land and, and take it to the But land on its own, um, land is the base of uh, uh, economic upgrade. And, and it hasn't really been given that emphasis in, 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 in the whole process. Absolutely. We're discussing the CODESA moment, particularly in 1991 and 1992, but also what it means for the present. We've had over 30 years since those fateful days. And on Mandela Day, we're reflecting on the process of negotiation in South Africa's history, its present and its future. We continue to deepen our debate on CODESA when we return. Don't go anywhere. We talk the economy, we talk redistribution and more. Welcome back to Unfiltered. Our democracy was birthed through negotiations and today we're putting those negotiations under the spotlight, particularly the CODESA moment of 91 and 92. Mr. Jordan, earlier you reflected on the nature of negotiations and the nature of compromise. But the question I think at the heart of many South Africans' minds is, did we go too far in those compromises? Did we give up more than was necessary? And I think particularly economically speaking, that has been the, the challenge that's been raised to the ANC's negotiating position that, yes, you scored important victories in the design of the state. You scored important victories in, you know, a unitary state. You scored important victories in getting rights. But the other side of the table was prepared to give you that because they knew that if the structure of the economy was preserved under a market logic, that all of that decoration around the state wouldn't amount to a fundamental redistribution of wealth in South Africa. And that was the bargain they made. And it was a wise bargain 30 years into our democracy if we look at the state of inequality. Well, that is an argument that I've heard made, and uh, there is some validity to that, because the negotiation process did not involve the economy directly. It was about the political institutions. But I think the thinking of the ANC and most of the people in the democratic movement at the time was that we needed to attain the beachhead of a democratic state in order to give us the instruments to bring about the sorts of changes uh, that were necessary to bring about greater economic equality, a better distribution of wealth, opportunities, etc. Now, I think perhaps uh, if one wants to look at the performance of the democratic government since uh, it came to power in 1994, uh, that is a very different question and we can do that. But I, I didn't think that this was the occasion to do that. I have my own uh, issues with respect to the performance of the democratic government since 1994, but I won't raise them here. What I will say is that the Constitution gave us the instruments with which to transform the society. How we use those instruments is another question. Uh, the challenge, I would say, of uh, economic transformation and people are demanding, and I've heard it said in many places that perhaps we need an economics codesa. Uh, that might well be a good idea to follow. But I think the challenge before us is for uh, <laughs> perhaps the millennials like yourself, Mr. Mbofu Walsh and others, uh, to now uh, take the ball and run with it. The instruments for bringing about the changes you want are there. And, uh, well, what do you guys say? Absolutely. Well, I, I, would, love to, I would love to have that, that conversation with you as well.
but now you're making me a, a participant rather than the person asking the questions. Um, but, I, I, you know, I do think it's interesting <laughs> on that, uh, Mr. Jordan, and, and I'll ask Mr. Carlisle on this, because there has been an interesting generational debate going on in our country over the last decade or so where younger South Africans have taken aim at this negotiating period. It's almost as if the miracle has been shoved down our throats so much that we are now rebelling or many of us have rebelled against this idea that we have inherited a miracle. Whereas, and of course not everyone, but an older generation of South Africans still clings quite firmly to the wisdom of this negotiated transition. Do you, do you have any view on the way this debate has actually panned generationally, Mr. Carlisle? Yeah, the, um, you know, your 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 central sort of proposition was the Cadiza Agreement fair for all. The answer to that, in fact, was given by uh, Dr. Jordan, and it's, it is that nobody gets what exactly what they want in a in a in an agreement of this nature. Everybody has to give something. But again, if you talk about a generational gap, you know. I, if I look at particularly young black South Africans, um, they have been cheated of education. It had nothing to do with the negotiations. They have been cheated of a growing economy. It had nothing to do with the negotiations. They have been cheated of life, in effect, because many of them, millions of them, are going into adulthood barely able to read and write. How, you know, this is a crime of, of, that is very great indeed. And I'm, you know, I, I accept the fact there's a generational gap, that there must be 20 or 30 million very angry young South Africans. Whether they blame the uh, uh, Codesa, whether they blame the, they've had a lousy deal. And that deal occurred under the ANC. And I can't see what differences could have been made to the CODESA process or to the Constitution that would have prevented the ANC from doing what it did can, can in I, any event. Can I come well in on that? Wiping the country off. Can I come in on that? Because Mr. Jordan said something interesting, and it's true if you look at the working groups of CODESA, I think there was one on the Constitution. There was one on an interim government, homelands. There was one on the timing of these political transitions. But one thing that wasn't there was the structure of the economy and the way that the economy would work into a democratic South Africa. And it seems to me that one of the biggest problems in democratic South Africa is that the economy simply hasn't changed much. So even if we concede that the state has, shall we say, underperformed, it was always destined to be an unequal country because of the inequality inherent in our economy, which seemed to go untouched in the, in the CODESA negotiations. Wasn't that a mistake? So who you addressing? That, for, for, for you, Mr. Carlisle. Oh, yeah. it was addressed. The economy was certainly addressed. Room was given in the constitution and in the, the, the provisions for new legislation for those kind of changes. Um, the ANC government chose a particular type of uh, economic system. There was nothing in Codessa that said you're not allowed to choose uh, a different one. But it's not the system that went wrong. It's not because they chose or were forced as some would say, they weren't forced, that they were forced to choose this one, which they didn't want. They were free and had the power to have any economic system they wanted. Okay. But let's, as far as I can to see, Mr. they Sir, didn't okay. want an economic system. They weren't interested. What they were interested in was what can I lay my hands on? And didn't they just? Okay, Mr. Seroke. How do you respond to, to the debate, some of the things that have been said, but also the fact that the economic question seemed to go relatively, if not completely, unexamined 
while we were figuring out the design of the state. And that has come back to haunt us. What, what do you make of that? Well, I think that's, that's the core of our problems. I mean, it's, it's, it's certainly true that the Constitution only looked at the, uh, the superstructure um, of, of the politics um, and, and all the basic freedoms that are given to the people, but never really addressing the core um, uh, item in the conflict between the oppressed and the, uh, and the oppressors, and which is the issue of the land. Um, and I'm, I we keep emphasizing the land because the boundary stand system, you only had the right to, to, to occupy, but not to own uh, the land. Uh, so, so that 13 percent we refer to, it's not land that belongs to the African people. Um, and that whole system has entrapped the majority of the people in, in, in poverty, and, and, and has not been we, in the past 30 years, have not been able to look at the core issues of the economy in order to transform and change society. Can I ask you uh, briefly before we go to a break, one thing that I think is on a lot of people's minds is, do you think, do you think that the ANC intentionally avoided this question, or do you think they miscalculated and thought that if they got their hands on the state, they'd be able to transform the economy? Was it intentional not to talk about the economy as much, or was it a miscalculation? Well, I don't, I don't know um, much about the ANC's thought processes, but the, 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 the approach has definitely been uh, to steadily get into changes over, over time. And um, in some instances, I think, uh, particularly in the early years, the leadership of the NC did very well. And they lost it uh, in, in, in the process and, and have, have not been able to focus on, on and they've, they've actually focused on their own internal problems and their, their weaknesses. And this has led to a myriad of many other problems that we're facing right now. Some of the policies they have taken up, including the BE policies, have not really uh, filtered down to, to, to the level where the masses uh, are able to, to benefit from it. We're talking South Africa's negotiated transition, but particularly the CODESA moment of 91 and 92, the era of multi-party democratic negotiations, which it inaugurated. We'll be back after the break as we reflect on whether CODESA in 91 and 92 is a model for South Africa to dig itself out of its current crises. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back to Unfiltered. We're talking CODESA and South Africa's democratic transition. Let's go to some of your comments on social media before we get back to the debate and discussion. Ernest says it was the worst decision by the ANC, but with the current ANC and government, it's worsening. We were sold a dummy. Bengeba says, I just want to see, quote, the sunset clause with my eyes. That's where our problems started. And Janika says, they killed the revolution and revolutionary comrades, and we are stuck with sellouts. Some strong views on social media there. And of course, this is a, a very provocative question. But uh, Mr. Jordan, could I return to you. You know, this is a, always a difficult debate to have because in some ways the past is always in conversation with the present. And so we look at the negotiations based on our experiences now. Mr. Carlisle says it's corruption that has actually undermined South Africa's democracy. Do you think that had the ANC governed even better or better than it has governed, in your view, do you think we would still look back on the CODESA moment with some of the skepticism that we've heard in social media? In other words, do you think the present is, is giving our view of the past this, um, this new view? this new pessimistic view? Well, I'm sure there's an element of that in it, but I think you will remember also that even at, uh, at the time we're having contestant uh, between 1991 and 93, 
there were many people who were very skeptical of the entire process and who were, some were actively, mm. actively opposed to it. I'm not only talking about people on the far right, but I'm talking about you know, even people amongst the oppressed mm. and historically oppressed who were opposed to it. So there's always been, uh, there have always been critics of Kodesa. Mm. What I will say is that, of course, uh, what comes after uh, you get a democratic government uh, is the basis on which people are going to judge a whole number of things. The negotiation process itself, they're going to judge uh, the governing party itself on the basis of that. They're going to judge its ministers on that. Uh, but I don't think that, uh, well, we can argue about the merits and demerits of those various arguments. Uh, but I don't think the problem lies with Kodesa. Uh, Robert Carlyle, unfortunately, uh, wants to use this as a party political broadcast. I mean, that's his right. That's his privilege. Uh, that's one of the things we fought for since 1912. The right of South Africans to express their views freely without let or hindrance. Uh, from either secular or clerical authorities. So he's free to do that. I don't want to make this a party political broadcast. I want to discuss Kodesa and its outcome. Mr. Sereko, what do you make of the, of the suggestion that, yes, th there was certainly compromise, maybe too much compromise, but at the end of the day, we got peace and we got stability. And that was a gift that is priceless in many ways because we didn't plunge into war. It's, it's easy to criticize with hindsight, but, but war is a terrible thing as, as we see around the world at the moment. And maybe the negotiations and Codessa in particular is actually what extricated us from the brink of, of a serious catastrophe. Um, like, like all revolutions and all, all struggles on a worldwide basis, uh, when you change phases and you get into a new dispensation, you are, you are met with different, a set of different circumstances, um, which could be um, a huge challenge. I mean, there are, there are always these uh, forward marches and backwards, uh, backwardness that, that happen. In, in our instance, we should have learned uh, from, from others that... Uh, um, uh, we must have a plan in place to develop the, our own communities, especially communities that had high expectations from those negotiations and, and those expectations were not met. Uh, communities who needed to be highly politicized and people had come from war uh, of sorts, have been involved in massive killings and that healing process on its own needed attention. There were lots of other uh, difficulties that um, uh, the country was facing, including um, the unipolar world, where in um, policies, economic policies were enforced on, 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 on governments, including the South African government. The um, uh, Washington consensus um, really uh, denudes uh, the powers of government from interacting in the, in the economy. And that on its own really uh, uh, provides the the well-being of the, the privileged to, to utilize the opportunities that are available to enrich themselves. Um, and so the policies that uh, the government has, has taken over the years have um, uh, worked not for the benefit of the masses. There was a social media comment about the sunset clauses which are often invoked in, in, in these debates. Uh, to what extent do you link those to CODESA and how do you see that uh, that moment and, and that decision affecting the present as well? No, Joe uh, uh, Slovo, Comrade Joe Slovo, when he made the sunset losses, it was an intention to pull in um, the, um, the, civil, the, the civil service of apartheid, not to, to, to move out, and, and he extended their contracts. And, and it's, 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 a, it's a clear policy um, to, to win over the oppressors or to to maintain stability in a process so that you can implement your changes as you, as, as you go on. I don't think, um, the, the only problem is that it was a surprise clause uh, that they brought in at, at, at the end. And it, I don't think it was fully debated, thought of. And, and, and um, I think at the, at the CODESA process itself, I mean, the give and take 
uh, during negotiations. Uh, there was a period when uh, the negotiations themselves were not um, taking place very well, so it was not debated. The, uh, and I'm telling you this because in 1993, after the killing of Chris Arnie, uh, from that period up to 1994, there, was, there were no uh, proper negotiations. The focus was on the day of the elections. So those details were not outlined, they were not debated, and they were not properly approved. I'm afraid we're running out of time. So, Mr. Carlisle, I'm going to only have, uh, be able to give you 30 seconds to just round off anything you'd like to say in the debate. Well, what were these things that the ANC didn't get? I can't remember any. They wanted the commanding heights of the economy. They largely got it. They wanted to have no federation. There was no federation. They wanted not to have constituencies. There were no constituencies. And so I could go on. The ANC got what they wanted. Out of the 18 parties represented, five actually formed the ANC bloc. Obviously, they got what they wanted. It's what they did with what they got. And it's not about what they didn't get. They got everything they wanted. And in the end, they took everything that we didn't want them to take. I'd just like to thank the panel. We've unfortunately run out of time. Mr. Jordan, thank you very much for your time and your insights. Mr. Carlisle, Mr. Seroke, we have dissected the negotiation process. It's past, it's present, and indeed it's future. Let's continue the conversation on social media. Do you believe that CODESA represented a selling out of the anti-apartheid struggle, or was it a necessary step on the road to peace and democracy? It's for you to decide. Join us again on Unfiltered for our next installment and have a good evening.